Hello all, I'm your host, Angela Taylor. We're here on Unlocking the Club. And first and foremost, I just wanna thank you for joining us again uh, for another episode of Unlocking the Club. And I wanted to open up the episode by sharing a few things that I'm grateful for. Recently, I actually took about 10 days to go on vacation, if you will, um, down to Texas, the Dallas area and East Texas, where I had the opportunity to spend some time with family. And I think over the last couple of years, for me in particular, my relationships with family and friends have been amplified in a way because we didn't have access to those opportunities to be in each other's company as frequently during COVID. And I think it was in this moment where I went to Texas and had a chance to spend time with my, my brothers and my father who traveled with me, as well as my cousins and my aunts and uncles and some extended family for the first time in about three years, that I realized that I am so grateful for family. And I think it was amplified by the fact that almost uh, you know 11 months ago, I lost my mother. And so this was the first time that I was in Texas for an extended period of time uh, with family and friends, um, not just for a wedding or not just for a business trip where I got to see a couple of people, um, but where we were um, really trying to see as many people as possible. It was the first time that I was there without my mother. And so that absence actually allowed me to appreciate and be grateful for the presence of the love from family and friends that live in Texas and East Texas. And so I just wanted to share with you all, I think that, again, the journey for the last couple of years for each of us has been very different. And some of us are closer to our families in proximity as well as just relationship. But for, for me, not just being able to drive an hour or two to see family on a regular basis um, and having to make a concerted effort to be able to get on a plane to travel to Texas, I'm recognizing that I need to make more space um, to be able to spend time with family and friends and be in conversation with them, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's via chats or group chats, whether we create some Zoom meetings so that we can be in conversation with each other, or if we're able to get on a flight and spend time in person, uh, being able to create space for family. And families aren't perfect, right? Sometimes there's those relationships that could use some repair Sometimes um, we know some of our family members better than others. Sometimes there may be some conflicts that arise from time to time, but family is all we have. And I was reminded of that, being at home, being able to visit the country where my grandmother spent a lot of time raising her family and having those memories of the people that lived down the street from her and, and reminiscing about the stories and taking a look at photos from when I was younger and uh, remembering those moments with family and sitting on the patio or the porch, drinking coffee and sharing stories and hearing about my mother or their father when they first started dating or hearing about their high school exploits and things that they dreamed about doing. Um, it just brought me home in a way that I hadn't felt in the last three years. And want to remind each and every one of you to make the most of those moments, whether it is with family or friends, um, to let them know how you feel, to say that you love them, to talk about the things that are important, um, to be able to talk about those things that sometimes go unspoken, those things that may be difficult to talk about, but to be in conversation with your family and your friends and your loved ones is something, again, over the last couple of years, I think that um, I started to appreciate much more. And so I am grateful for my family, for those that made space for me um, for the 10 days that I was in Texas, for those that shared stories, helped me find out more about my mother, about my, my family history, about why family is really your heart and soul and why you feel at home with family, whether you are um, thousands of miles from where you live, or if you're with people that you're in conversation with on a regular basis or that you don't talk with that frequently. Uh, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about making the most of those moments and those opportunities, whether it's with your family or with your friends, with today's guest, uh, Jasmine Brett Stringer. So I'm really excited to be in, in conversation with our guest today. Welcome to the Unlocking the Club podcast, where we host honest and direct conversations about journeys of access, personal truth, and reclaiming space. 
We share our truth so that you can find the key to own your truth, honor your journey, and reclaim your space. Grab your keys, your wallet, your phone, and invite your friends to meet you at the club. Here's your host, Angela Taylor. Today on Unlocking the Club, I will be joined by Jasmine Brett Stringer. Jasmine is an uplifting keynote speaker and award-winning author of Seize Your Life, How to Carpe Diem Every Day, an on-air TV personality, host of the podcast and lifestyle blog, Carpe Diem with Jasmine, and founder of Share the Mic Minnesota, hashtag Share the Mic MN. In these times of transformational change, Jasmine is on a mission to help people live empowered and authentic lives. Through her Seize Your Life keynotes, workshops, and customized coaching sessions, Jasmine guides clients and audiences through a simple process to identify their goals and achieve their personal definition of success. A graduate of American University, Jasmine was named one of the 100 people to know in 2021 by Twin Cities Business Magazine, a Twin Cities Fearless Woman in 2017, and a Woman of Promise by the Girl Scouts in 2012. She also received the 2020 Team Women Community Impact Wavemaker Award. Additionally, she was awarded Distinguished Alumna of American University and is an active member of the National Speakers Association. Ebony Magazine featured her as one of its 30 future leaders under the age of 30, 30 in America. Jasmine is based in Minneapolis, but can often be found two hours south of the city, working with her husband at the family farm. Thanks for tuning in as we unlock the club with Jasmine Brett Stringer. Good morning, Angela. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I was getting teary-eyed listening to you talk about family. We lost the matriarch of my family this summer, my great aunt, and I'm going to come back to like some time that I had with my cousins. Last week, I lost two very dear friends, a, a heart aunt, not a blood aunt, but one of my mom's dear friends from college, and the dear one of my sister friends, you know, we adopted each other as sisters. She adopted my parents as her parents, and she was the sister I, I never had. And so you were spot on when you talk about um, taking the time to connect with family and friends and not only taking the time, but really being intentional. So I know like I'm from Atlanta. I have a trip home um, coming up next month and I'm coming home for an event and I need to do something with my dad. And I already feel the agenda feeling up, you know, the itinerary of things that I have to do, that I have to do, that I'm, I don't really have that time, as my mom would say, to just be. And so now I'm like, what can I readjust in my schedule after listening to you? so that I can perhaps stay a little longer, so that I can get that just be time with family where it's not, yes, I want to see you, we're at dinner, and then, you know, running off to the next thing. But it's like, yeah, we're having coffee in the backyard, and whatever happens, happens, because it's not like I have to be somewhere in an hour and a half, and I only have 45 minutes to be here, and I run late, you know, just that, that I would call it breathing time with your family. Yes, no, you're spot on. And, and it's wonderful having you on the show today, Jasmine. I, I agree with you. I think in this Instagram and Twitter world, we oftentimes are looking for those photogenic moments, right? The things that we can post on social media and have all of our friends and family be in awe like, of those moments. And those are important, but it's just the time that you are just in each other's company that don't have to be remarkable. That doesn't have to be something that you can take a picture of and post on social media, but it's so cathartic and informative and invigorating for each person that you're just spending time with. And I yeah. think for me inside of COVID, I learned that just spending time with yourself and with others is more valuable than having these extraordinary activities or adventures to go on. Like what have well, you th heard? that You're speaking my language, Angela, because that's yeah. exactly what I mean when I talk about carpe diem. Mm. And when you talk about seizing the day, people think that we have to do these grandiose, do it for the gram, uh, TikTokable moments <laughs> and experiences. Yeah. 
but it's really these everyday encounters of how we show up. You know, I don't look like this all the time. <laughs> I, I look like this probably 2% of the time. So it's like, you know, do I post a lot of pictures not looking like this? Probably not. You know, my dad was just here and it was really good quality time. And I must admit that it was like, oh, we're dropping him off at the airport. And I'm like, wait a minute, we didn't get a picture because, you know, it was just regular, you know, watching a movie, eating Pizza Hut pizza down at the farm, you know, at a tractor pull, just regular life. And then even just trying to be present, I didn't want to pick up my phone because I know sometimes you pick up your phone and get a, take a picture and you get distracted and then you go to Instagram and you go to email and you go to text and then you start that strolling. So in trying to be present, I didn't even pick up the phone. So maybe I need to invest in an old school camera. <laughs> That is true, right? Otherwise, you're getting all the, the notifications from the emails and text messages, and you're not paying attention to just who you're with. Correct. Yeah. Well, Jasmine, again, thrilled to have you on the show today, exactly for this, because I think that all of us in general, but specifically Black women, who oftentimes are there for everybody else and not always prioritizing ourselves, need to carpe diem. Yeah. And um, would love to find out like what it means to seize the day, to carpe diem in your mind. You know, to seize the day in my mind is to have a, a at the end of the day, a, a satisfying day. And when I say a satisfying day, again, it's not like it was, you know, full of adventures, but it's one of those days where I can say I'm proud of myself. I'm proud of what I gave to the world. I'm proud of what I accomplished. Oh, I had a new experience. I learned something new. I, I read, you know, I'm reading Think and Grow Rich for the third time because I'm part of this mastermind. And you would think the third time of the book and I even listened to the book, what are you really gonna glean from it? But I had a great conversation with my mastermind yesterday about the book yesterday evening. And I thought, oh yeah, this is really powerful. So for me, it's really the level of satisfaction at the end of the day. You mentioned gratitude. I start my day with a gratitude practice. I try to capture at least five things that I'm thankful for from the previous day or even even setting the tone in a, in a, in a declaration for the new day in the morning when I'm, I'm doing my gratitude practice. I love that. Well, well two things when you talk about rereading a book. I was on Twitter recently and I saw a great Twitter thread where the gentleman said something to the effect of, you know, read four books a month for knowledge, reread four books a month for wisdom. And so mm -hmm. the fact that you've read that book three times and listened to it again as well, right, you are able to take different things away from it, right? The wisdom that you're able to share with your, your group um, and mastermind probably um, was enhanced and augmented by the fact that you've read it multiple times. Um, but you said something earlier about Carpe Diem being about proud of what you've accomplished, proud of who you are. What are you most proud of about this enterprise that you've created around Carpe Diem with Jasmine? You know, at the end of the day, when I think about what I'm most proud of is, you know, this is a, a business of service that I am helping others. I want to, you know, I, I use the word empower, but I really am saying that, you know, I want to help people find their power, reclaim their power, step into their power, own their power, empowering. I'm like, I'm not Jesus, I'm not God, but if I can help you get in touch and own it and show up differently, that makes me feel good. So what I am most proud of is the impact that all of my endeavors have had. And so that that's a part of my legacy. When people say, I've done, um, you know, this helped my business, you helped my business, or you reframed my thinking about something, and I was able to do this. Or, you know what, I, I listened to that conversation that you and Angela were having that podcast, her podcast, and you both, you know, shared some things about your family. And I decided that I'm having, my cousins are coming to Minnesota MLK weekend. I was going to book a, a, a cousin's family trip too. So really, the most, the biggest thing that I am proud of is my impact. Yes, yes. Well, I always say empowered women empower others. Yeah. Right? yeah. And so 
what empowered you to show up so fully over the course of your life? And who did you have to be along the way during that journey? You know, I am blessed that I had a, a very strong mother. I am a very loving mother, a beautiful mom, a smart mom, a supportive mom. But my mom is quick. I always say, like, she has a quick tongue. She's a comedian, but she will cut you to the white meat and she will let you know if you are out of line. But one of the things is that she was my biggest using, you know, words that are popular is my first ally. Like she would advocate for me. I remember I had a teacher who, you know, called my parent, my parents were divorced, but called my mom and said, Jasmine's asking too many questions in the class. And so my mom said, well, is she being rude? Is she being disruptive? No, but she's just asking a lot of questions well, okay, why don't we channel that? And if you don't know the answer, why don't you say, Jasmine, that's a great question. Why don't you do some research and come back and share the answer with the class, you know, next week or in a, in a designated time frame? So my mom showed up for me. And so I, I take that in a big way in the work that I do is that I try to show up for others and help them show up for themselves. Absolutely, right? And, and I love the fact that your mom did do that because I think so often, particularly in the classroom, like we're told how we should show up, right? Right. And here's 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 the standard of how we expect people to show up. And if someone is showing up differently, that is wrong, as opposed to us appreciating how uniquely you showed up in the classroom, asking questions, being curious. And I will tell you, Angela, you know, I went to predominantly white schools most of my life. I you know I was the only for all of elementary school. Um, you know, a few, a part of a few later in life. And that was my experience with my first Black teacher, mm, that she tried to silence my voice that way. Wow. Did you ever unpack that a little bit to get to the bottom of it? Or did you understand it in that moment what was going on? I did not understand it in that moment. It wasn't until I um, to much later in life. And now, you know, I give a talk and I, I talk to people about the power of the ask. And so I really do think in unpacking it, that it was um, her experience and that she was really in love trying to protect me. Yes. And she was saying, you know, look, this little brown girl is asking a lot of questions. She's probably going to rub some people the wrong way, get on their nerves. And so she didn't say it that way. Let me stop this now because I, I, I've i seen where this can go. I've seen the road that this can go on. So let me nip it in the bud so that she doesn't have those pains later on in life. And she yeah. didn't think about like how it could mute my voice or how it could alter the way I show up in the world, the way I move in the world. But I actually do believe that it was out of a place of love based on her limited experience. And we all have limited experiences because I, you know, people always say, well, what can I help you with? And I always say, you know, my biggest problem is I don't know what I don't know. So if you could go back when you were in a place similar to mine, what did you wish you knew at that time? Or what do you know now that you think can help me at this point? Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, and that's an important thing to unlock, like, right. It is, is how we show up as people inside of marginalized or historically excluded identities. Like how our experience and life's work may impact how we guide others on their journey. Because I have no doubt that that teacher was trying to protect you from things that she's seen, things that she probably unfortunately had, you know, um, had done to her. And she didn't want that to happen to this rising star, this bright star, Jasmine Brett, that she had in her classroom. And with, the, with Unlocking the Club, one of the things that I wanted to do, Jasmine, was for us to share these stories of what happens and to notice that we're not alone. It's not unique, but there's a system that has us show up that way. And so she had it be about you and how you were showing up versus the system not accepting you for how fully you were showing up in the classroom. What are some other spaces that you've had to unlock along your way in your journey? Yeah, um, I write about it in my book, but I remember I had a manager. I smile a lot. I'm an outgoing personality. I bring a lot of energy to spaces. And I remember I had a, a manager tell me, you smile too much. And, you know, leadership is tough. 
leaders don't smile. And so I changed the way I was moving at work. I'm stumping around the office. I got my, you know, resting Mm -hmm. bee face uh, before it was called a resting bee face. I'm not really engaging with people because, wait a minute, I'm a leader and leaders are tough. And so I've gotten the feedback that I can't smile. I can't be outgoing. I can't interact with people because I need to be tough. And I was killing myself trying to be tough, you know, because it's like, no, leaders can smile. Maybe you haven't encountered leaders that smile, but I am a smiling person. Then on the other hand, you know, I've had people that say like, oh, you smile too much. Where does the smiling come from? And so I literally talk about sitting in silence with yourself. I said, now, now is this an authentic smile that I'm wearing or is this me listening to the world? And again, you know, I'm a five foot 10 black woman, I have a certain stature that I'm smiling to lessen someone else's perception. And then I realized that no, the smile is who I am. This is my joy. You know, this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, the world didn't take it away. And the joy was given to me in the form of this smile. But that was a lesson of unpacking the sea. Like, wait a minute. Well, that tough leadership statement. And then well, was I conditioned by the world and I'm trying to put other people at ease? Yes, yes. Well, and what did it take you to get to that realization? I imagine immediately you started smiling less, right? But what point in your journey were you able to say, wait a minute, that was not the advice that was going to help me show up fully and be authentic? I think I tried at work. I, I was stomping around and not smiling for about three months and I was going home tired. I was drained. I was having headaches. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You know, so that it was about a three month process of trying this experiment at work. And then, you know, fast forward a few years later when I was like, well, wait a minute, let, let's reexamine this again, because I think it's the most absurd thing to tell somebody they're smiling too much or ask somebody, why are you? Sm-? We need more smiles in the exactly. world. So I said, well, wait a minute. This is feedback that I'm getting. And it, it's come back before. Let me examine this. And so now I say that my smile is my gift. I might not have much to give to a world, to the world, but I can offer someone a smile. And who knows, maybe that smiling face is the thing they need that day to tell them to keep on pushing on. Amen. Amen to that. And, and you remind me of a conversation we had on this show recently with Renee Brown, who is a mentor of mine. And, and we talked a lot, Jasmine, about others trying to steal your shine, mm-hmm. right? to make you so small in order to to give them space to be seen. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, and not everybody, right, will give you advice, not because it's advice to help you elevate your standing and your presence, but to actually make others feel comfortable or others be able to have more space in the room. And you talk about your physical presence, like, right? Like, so I've had the, the fortune of kind of being in a space with you and, I get a strong sense that you are a mission-driven visionary and would love to hear what your life's mission is and how did you discover that uh, and actually who you had to be to bring that vision to life. Yeah, you know, right. You know, you like you mentioned, I, I come in taking up space and so you can't do that. And so I always say that I am on a mission to help people live more authentic, connected, and mindful lives. Now, like, let's unpack that. What does it mean to be authentic? Authentic is, and this is not my quote, it's a fellow speaker's quote, but it's like being the USU. Like, so who are you? You know, yeah, I love to like paint my face and, you know, comb my hair and get my hair done. But yet I'm Jasmine that likes to play in the dirt at the farm and have my vegetable garden and doing this canning. And so those are two different worlds. Like you could say, well, how does this person enjoy this and then enjoy this? I also like a glass of Chardonnay. I also love speaking on the stage and engaging and inspiring audiences. But yet I like doing consulting projects where it's like, okay, how can I help an organization connect with the new audience? Or how can I help them increase their engagement? Or how can I help them tell the story of a a particular initiative or project? And so Jasmine is very layered. I'm like a good onion. And most people are like (laughs) good onions. We have a lot of layers. And so in living an authentic life and in helping people live authentically connected and mindful lives, 
I'm trying to leverage, you know, my my layers at the appropriate time. I love the play connector. I think I play connector on your behalf. You know, I was always like, oh, you should know this person. Let me connect you to this person. Um, because people, we need each other. We are all connected in some shape or form. And this divide, whether it's racial, whether it's political, whether it's social, economic, we need to stop, we need to stop the BS and recognize that we are all humankind. Um, and really all spiritual beings trying to have this human experience. And so what if we were better connected to one another or just, you know, a little bit more tolerant and then mindful, which is, you know, I'm, we're going to talk about my love, my re uh, connection to the game of golf, but like, you know, how do you just take the time to just be, how do you just like catch a beat? and you know engage in what you're doing as opposed to multitasking because we we are and i'm 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 like guilty of it so i'm always like oh yes i need to practice this you know like i said i don't want to i want to get a, a regular camera because i know it's so easy for me to get caught up in this phone so if i the more i can be away from it the better it is for me to be a mindful person yes yes well, and i love just being able to understand how you can just be. And for you, who again has all of these career accomplishments, you are action oriented, results driven, being able to just be, right? To be quiet, to to be in, in wellness with yourself, I imagine is a little bit of a is of a, of a challenge. And, and I'll just tell you a little story. Um, when I was in New York City, I lived in New York City for about 10 years and I had a, a classmate and a teammate from, from Stanford, um, Jennifer Azy, who was out in New York visiting. And she asked me a question one evening at dinner and she was like, you know, have you ever taken a look at um, a FedEx truck and noticed the logo? And I was like, this is the most random question. I'm like, uh, yeah, it's like, you know, orange and purple, Jen, like, you know, no big deal. Like answer the question, let's move on to the next topic. And she's like, no, have you really ever looked at the logo? And she's like, I challenge you the next time you see a truck to look at the logo and see if you see something that you haven't observed that you, or at least that you haven't mentioned to me. So the next day, you know, I'm on the subway heading to work, get off the subway uh, and there's a FedEx truck uh, on my way to the office. And I look at it and I spent about five minutes sitting there looking at the logo. And I finally saw it. I saw that arrow going forward and I had never seen it before. And I realized what the message was she was trying to convey to me. Like I had been living in New York and I was caught up in, in being in New York, of having something on my schedule every single day to do, to go out to a concert, to go to dinner, to see this, to go to the park, all of these things. And I wasn't just consuming and absorbing myself and who I was and pausing to recognize what was fueling me, what I needed, um, how I wanted to be better, what I could give to others, what I was learning from others, all of those different things. And it taught me to be present. Like I was in New York City, but I wasn't present to everything that was around me. I was just present to the things that I was doing. And so I wonder, how do you be present? Yeah. Like how much a season of day is about being present? I think it is. I mean, I would say all of it should be about being present, but, you yeah. know, being realistic, it's, you know, we are not always fully present. But, you know, listening to you talk about that FedEx truck story, I always like to ground myself in the day. So I come into my office or I come into a space, I do some breathing and I, and I begin to just like engage my senses, like, so what do I feel? Like if I have on shoes, you know, am I feeling the soles of my feet in the shoes? If I'm barefoot, ooh, I'm, I'm feeling the ground. What's the temperature of the ground? What am I feeling in the temperature of the room? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it just right? Am I getting a little goose bump? What's my bum on? Is it comfortable? Do I need to readjust? What, a, what am I smelling? Mm -hmm. And I just, you know, and it's not a very long exercise. It's, you know, maybe three minutes of just breathing and centering myself in the space. And I always think of it as centering myself in the day. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm what dead. if we could do that for every experience? Yeah. yeah. You know, if I could just greet you with a smile and just look at you. 
and look in your eyes and you know look at your hair look at your neckline and your black flowers and look at you and not go to the background but just center in on you because i'm having this experience with you right now yeah yeah that's powerful yeah right? in ways that i think that we don't that we discount mm -hmm. to a certain extent and i'm not sure if this is your experience but oftentimes we solve problems, right? And so we solve for something that may have been missing in our life. Was there something missing in your life, in your journey that you needed to fill and teach others to fill? I don't know the answer if I could say something was missing in my life, but I can say this, and I don't know why, but God always, like I'm always given opportunities to practice what I preach and, you know, and I get them and I'm like, oh, oh, okay. This is, you know, I'm talking to myself now. So Jasmine, you, you think you, you're the expert on how people can seize the day. How are you going to seize the day? You know, I, I mentioned last week that I lost two people that were very near and dear to me. And I canceled my evening. I was supposed to go to an event. I was actually supposed to go to two things and I, I ended up canceling and I didn't even tell the people I I no showed. So I didn't even cancel. I no showed because I just was in shock. I was sad. And then I'm sitting at home and my husband's gone. Our dog is gone. And I was like, you know, I don't know. I'm I don't want to be by myself right now. So I call a friend. I go over there. And you know, it was a nice visit. I just needed I really needed the energy and warmth of some other people. And then I, I come back home and in the morning I had this call and I woke up and I was so sad and I called the person to tell them that I'm not in a good place. Like I can't talk to you right now. And they stopped and they said, no, Jasmine, like, tell me about these people. And I mean, it was awful. It was like, I'm crying. I'm like, I mean, it wasn't awful. It was beautiful. It was raw. I should say that. I was yeah. very raw and yeah. I'm snotting and it's like, you know, <laughs> not buttoned up Jasmine at all. Yeah. And so I said, oh yeah, I, I just need this. I, I'm like, and I was supposed to travel that day. I'm canceled everything. I'm like, I'm just going to wallow in grief because I am so sad. I am shocked. I'm questioning why on one of these deaths, like, you know, and I even said that, you know, I, I don't even know. You're not supposed to question God, but Job questioned God. So I'm I'm feeling all of these things. Yeah. And I'm just going to put my purple robe back on and close the shades and sit in the middle of the bed. And that is great. And, you know, and I did give myself some space and time to do that. And then I called my husband and or he called me and said, like, what's going on? And I was like, I'm just so sad. And he's like, yeah, I understand it. But he said, is that the best way for you now for you to honor these, you know, these people, you know, would they want Miss Carpe Diem wallowing or would you be honoring them if you continue to do your work and help and inspire others to seize the day? Yeah. And I was like, oh yeah, you're right. You're right. I mean, so I said, he like slapped me out. And then I, we went in this conversation about empathy and all of these things. And so I say in that there were two things. One, I needed to give myself time to be, to have the raw emotion, to wallow in it. I needed that. Yes. But then I needed to remember that, wait a minute, Jasmine, you're still alive. So you got to get back in the land of the living. Yes, you were sad. Yes, you were grieving. Yes, you were shocked, rightfully so. And these emotions, they're very fluid. They come and go. And so be aware that this is where you are in this state. Yeah. But get back about the business of life. Don't yeah. let it paralyze you. Right. Yes. Don't let it paralyze you. And I think that that was an important juxtaposition, but there's something else that showed up as you were sharing that story that I'm curious about. Um, and you've mentioned a couple of times of like how you show up, like, right. Of, you know, of, of having the makeup on the hair done, nails done, right. Of having the smile on and, and showing up powerfully right? For others to see you showing up that way. Uh, and I wonder how much time we all spend as humans in general, but specifically as Black women, um, of having to worry about our presentation versus our um, the impact that you want to have. Yeah. 
Like, has that been a priority for you? And how does that um, help you achieve your goals? How does that impede you, that pressure impede you from actually achieving your goals? Well, one, I don't think it's pressure because it's something that I actually enjoy. And like I said, I'm only showing up like this uh, on camera, you know, half the time my hair is pulled back at like no makeup, on. you know, like literally last week I, I started a new like kind of dance workout class, like community education. And there's this le a, le a legend in our community. And I was like, oh, you know, hi, it's so nice to see you. And so the other women were like, oh my God, like, first of all, I'm the only black person in this class. They were surprised she knew me. And, you know, I said something and they're like, well, then they're like trying to size me. Well, who are you? What, you know? And I mean, I didn't even go there, but I will say that I show up like this for me because it makes me feel good. The makeup, the hair, I, you know, I do it for me. Like some people don't like makeup. They don't like getting their hair done. And yeah. so they don't do it. Like, so I stopped getting my nails done. Look at my nails. I realized that getting my nails done was a chore that I did not enjoy in my toes that I was like cramming it in on a busy to-do list, something to check off. And so I decided that I'm only going to get my nails done and a pedicure when I can enjoy the experience because it's not doing anything for me. It's it's yeah. stressing me out more than I'm enjoying, right. enjoying doing it. Right. So does that make sense? So you have to That's decide right. what works yeah. for you. You know, yeah, I like a polished look. And I think it does probably stem from my mother. My mom is a beautiful woman. And I remember as a young child thinking I had two moms. Like I had this glamorous mom and then I had like this like regular, like God, I called her mean mommy in my mind. Like where's this mean body coming from? And so I'm I'm from that era. And so it's it's a, a part of me that I do enjoy. And then there's a part of me where it's like, yep, the hair is pulled back, it's a ponytail, it's a clean face, and you keep it moving. Yeah. You have to decide well, what works for you. What works for you. Now that that's a hundred percent true. And like you said, it's for me. Like what does that create for you? Yeah. I mean, it, it's a it's a confidence boost. I like to look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, girl, you're looking. I tell myself I'm looking good. I make myself, you know, smile a little more. I wink at myself because, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so it is definitely probably more for me than, than other people. Yeah, now, I think it's an important thing to note and notice, right? And and um, Deion Sanders, right, the legendary NFL player, i um, always said, um, look good, feel good, right? Feel good, play good, play good, pay good, right? Is that sometimes like how you feel when you are showing up uh, allows you to show up powerfully, in ways. And so for some people, it may be what you're wearing. Some people it may be how you're looking. Some people it may be the space that you're in. But the important thing is what you just mentioned is is actually noticing it right. and being able to recreate that when necessary so that you can show up powerfully. Yeah. I love that. Back when I was in college and I didn't even know, I think Deion Sanders played for the Falcons, I believe. Didn't he yes. play for the yep. Falcons? Yep. Showtime, yep. right? Is he Showtime, yep. Deion? I'm not the yes. biggest sports person. Prime time. Yep, prime time. Oh, yeah. prime, prime time, not Showtime. Prime time. Um, but even when I was in college, like I would dress for success. So I say dress for success. And I didn't go to an HBCU where you had to dress up for test or because you were in the business school. But I always dressed on test days or presentation days because I was dressing for success. So maybe it's just a part of my upbringing. But I do believe in that I feel differently when and I show up differently when I when I when I when I'm dressed differently versus not dressed differently. And there's a time and place for everything. Like I said, you know, ninety percent of the time it's a ponytail because nobody's seeing. Me. You know, I'm seeing myself. I'm seeing a dog. I'm seeing my husband. But then sometimes I, it's just me, and I need to dress for myself still. During the pandemic, I will never forget. I, it must have been December, twenty twenty. I, you know, we're feeling down, like pandemic, what are we going to do? And it's like, I have this great closet full of clothes that I've been, you know, somewhat wearing, but not really. I'm not going to any holiday parties. I love sparkles. I love a cocktail dress. So I'm going to put this stuff on every single day for me. 
for me. And then, you know, I would get on Zooms with people. And at that time, people were still very much in their athleisure wear. And they say, oh, Jasmine, you're dressed so nice. Da, 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 da. No, I'm dressed for me because I want to wear my clothes that I have. And this makes me feel good. Right. And every day, my husband would say, where are you going? I'm, I'm going downstairs to get on <laughs> Zoom. But, you know, I think people would be shocked on the other side of the computer monitor that I took the time. But I was like, yeah, I'm doing this for me because this is making me feel good in this shutdown world that we're living in. Yes, yes. Well, I want to dig into something else that I'm curious if you were doing it for you um, was you started Share the Mic Minnesota. Yeah. And uh, I believe that the, the genesis of this was um, the social and racial unrest and reckoning that happened in the summer of, of 2020. Tell us a little bit about Share the Mic Minnesota and what was that creating for you? Right. So, you know, um, I live in Minneapolis, Minnesota, the epicenter, you know, I call it ground zero of this new awakening, which I think should be a rephrase now because I'm like, it seems like the new awakening is on like hiatus. Right. <laughs> it's just like we were awakened and then we returned to status quo. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really born out of um, two things, like my pain. So I'm sitting in my pain and I'm like, well, what can I do, you know? Again, you mentioned uh, that bias for action to drive results. So yes, I'm very much motivated by action. So what can I do? Um, I'm feeling, I'm in my emotions, feeling some kind of way. And then I remember that, like, again, you know, going back to my childhood and even now, like for so many people, I am their Black friend, Jasmine. And that that can be exhausting. Now, I will tell you, because I will tell people, like, I am not the authority, like, I don't, this is what this is what Jasmine likes, but you talk to someone else, they're going to tell you something different. And I realized that, again, this device, we spend so much time on it and we these social media apps. And to quote Maya Angela, ain't we bad and ain't we black, that poem, I love that. Like, we are so diverse. There's so many issues. Our experiences are so different. Look at you in Boise, Idaho, you know? <laughs> Right. right. Minneapolis and Boise. Right. Like, yeah. And we're, you know, we're having a good life. Yes. And so how do you meet people where they are? Mm. And again, going back to my mission of connection and authenticity, I thought, well, why not do a social media takeover pairing, you know, Black women with people, non-Black women that want to be an allies and allow somebody to take over their social media account um, for the day. And then you could learn something. They could, you know, you could say, yeah, I'm Angela in Boise. My family's from Texas and we love plants. And I could say, oh yeah, I'm Jasmine. I hate plants. I only believe in bow plants and pictures of plants because I don't want the air to be, you know, I mean, not that that's the truth, but you know, because we could have conflicting or, or varying, not even conflicting, but varying opinions and just varying thoughts and perspectives. So in the spirit of meeting people where they are, that's how we started. Mm, that's beautiful. And what have you, what's the feedback that you were seeing from Black women that are sharing their stories? Oh, because I mean, you know, we talk about this halo effect. I think one, it's nice for people to share their story with a different platform and hear that they've been heard, that they've been understood, that they've been respected. But the halo effect of what, you know, what organic opportunities lead from somebody, not only saying, you know, I think about, you know, Go Rocky, uh, Audra Robinson, with Go, Go Rocky Robinson, like not just buying the products, but maybe saying, oh, I heard about you and I'm going to connect you with this person or, you know, I work on this TV station and they're interviewing people. So just the halo effect of, again, getting out of our own sphere. Like I, I think I told you, I don't know what I don't know. And we are all in our own worlds. But if we could like expand our spheres a little bit more, what does that look like to expand? Yes. No, and I think that that's the premise of Unlocking the Club, right? It was born out of these conversations that I had with my mother um, that were different over the last few years than they were throughout my lifetime. But the stories that was was having a conversation with my mother about, um, again, editing ourselves to protect each other. And I think it's so important for us to hear those stories. And for whether you are in the same identity or in different identities, to hear about leadership and life and carpe diem and all these learnings through the prism of a Black woman's voice. Right. I think it's incredibly powerful. What are some of those stories that you've learned from 
through the Share the Mic Minnesota campaign? You know, what have I learned? I mean, I've learned that we all have a story. And not only do we all have a story, I think it's reconfirmed that we all we all want to be understood, you know, um, and that people, people really do care. And life moves at such a fast pace these days. This is what I know. Life is moving at such a fast pace that it is so easy, again, for us to get caught up in our own world, in our own sphere, and that we lose sight of the other people that we are connected to that aren't in our sphere with us that aren't, um, I don't like the word, you know, in the box with us because we're just, we're just focused, focused on, on what we see. And so the beauty of having women share their platforms and, and a few men share their platforms was the invitation and the invitation that they were providing to their friends and their network to come and learn about someone else and learn about their experience, learn about what they're doing and what makes them tick and their business or, you know, their career. Yes, yes. So you're unlocking these voices in a really powerful way. And you've been doing it throughout your journey, right? With all the things through your book, uh, through uh, the different things that you do from a media standpoint. What is the next thing that you want to unlock, Jasmine? Gosh, what do I want to, I want to unlock some more, but I want to go back to that because I just, as I'm, uh, sometimes I process by speaking. And so I, I really do think that the invitation is so powerful. The invitation to say, um, I want you to hear from someone else. The invitation to say, Jasmine, I think you have a valid story or you have someone that can, that uh, someone can learn from, would you come on unlocking the club? So that invitation that you extended to me, the invitation that Share the Mic created for these women to share their stories, the invitation that the people, you know, sharing their social media platforms created. So, you know, who are we inviting to things? Mm -hmm. And not just, you know, physical parties or meetings, but what kind of invitations are you extending in your life? Mm, that's a powerful question. Yeah. And where do you find yourself in this part of your journey, this stage in your evolution? Like who are you prioritizing inviting into your journey? You know, it's funny because sometimes I'm like, oh, I, what's the song? No new friends. I don't need, <laughs> but I cannot do that because that's, that, it's, it's not me. I mean, I love people. So, you know, I, I, I meet people at the grocery store. I met my husband in baggage claim. I mean, oh my goodness. so I, and I've always, my mom says, you've always picked up people. So, you know, but if I were to be intentional, more intentional about who I'm inviting, I'm inviting people that are maybe questioning or searching or seeking that's what's next because I've been there and you know, you're know you on that journey of what's next because I think that's where I can offer some assistance or people in transition. I always say like, I'm a good person. I'm a good friend when you are walking through something um, and maybe it is the optimism. Uh, maybe it is the empathy that I've been practicing. And so I just really wanna invite people that are, are seeking to be the best person they can be at this moment and recognizing that our best is a fluid state. So my best today might not be my best tomorrow because what if I didn't go to sleep? You know, what if this grief comes back in me? So best is very fluid. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, a, a good friend of mine said something to me one day um, a few months ago was saying that you know, people may look at you and, and look at this checklist of accomplishments and say, you know, Angela's in the club. And so why does she have this feeling that she's not in the club? And I think people may look at you, Jasmine, and say, like, she's doing everything, like, right? She was on Oprah, she's accomplished all these things, she's written a book, she's a highly sought after speaker, um, she's super successful. And, right, how do you feel with all those accomplishments when you take a step back to think about your journey? How do you feel about that journey? What's missing? What are you most proud of? What do you want to create more of? Yeah. So when I look at the journey, I am proud of the journey. But I would say, God willing, my journey is not done. 
So I honestly do believe that I have so much more to accomplish. So you said like you could look and say, oh yeah, you've done all of these things. You were asking me what's next. So I want to write two more books. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I need to add more. I'm like, do I write a whole nother book or do I just, you know, update Seize Your Life? Because I think this book is still so very valid and needed for such a time like this, but there's some additional stories that I could add to it. I want to write um, a children's book and I'm talking about professionally. I want to write a, a children's book that's been placed on my heart. Um, you know, I want to grow my speaking business. I want to speak on different stages, bigger stages. Um, you know, now that the world is moving forward and we are traveling and moving around, I want to, you know, I want to get on the plane a little bit more. I'm going to go across some ponds, across some oceans, go to some different continents and speak because I, before I had the opportunity to speak in the UAE for several years, I've spoken in Brazil. So I enjoy international audiences and I would, I would like to do that. I want to crack the streaming nut. You know, I work with um, local stations, our CBS station here and another show, but streaming, you know, that's really important these days. How many people are, are watching television? You look at the numbers, you look at the trends, you know, we know that the numbers do tell a story. And so we have to be cognizant of the num of the story the numbers are telling. So I would like to figure out streaming. I know you're doing it with your podcast on YouTube and things of that nature. So I, I need to, to figure that out. So there are uh, several things that, you know, I want to do professionally. Um, personally, I want to remain healthy. You know, I recommitted to health and fitness. I, you know, I have some number goals there. Um, I, I've, debating, do I do another sprint triathlon in my life? I've done one. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that I'm a good wife and partner. My philosophy is, again, this word best, give your best to the nest. I can't be like smiling on Zoom and, you know, smiling out and about and encouraging other people. And then in the house, I'm a witch with a capital B because I've given everything to the world. No, I've got to give my best to my nest. And so what does that look like? And how do I do that? We talk about, people talk about balance a lot, right? You know, like, but I don't know if I really want to be in balance. I just want to be happy. Because when you think about balance, you're kind of at a standstill, you know, a scale and balance is like doing that little, but I want to be moving forward. And so I want to be moving forward in a way that is at a comfortable pace, that is at a way, at a, at a peaceful pace. Um, and in a manner that can be sustained by me, again, running my own race. Yes, yes. Well, and then what we know, balance is how you define it. Yeah. Right? Because for, for entrepreneurs and visionaries such as you, you get so much out of creating and doing, right? Um, and for others, like they may need to carve out more space to relax uh, and to be, right? And, and, and we don't have to define balance for us by what it looks like for somebody else. And that's right. the true opportunity is to figure out what fills our cup um, and what makes us happy um, and what makes us joyous. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point, Angela. I mean, everything in life, we need to define balance for ourselves. We need to define success for ourselves. We need to define joy for ourselves. Um, I think you, I was listening to the previous episode of your podcast and you were talking about the Michelle Obama speech with the supposed to be. There is no supposed to be. I remember I told my husband when we got married, there is no supposed to be. Like this is our marriage rewriting the rules. So don't ever tell me if we didn't agree to it, it's not supposed to be that way. Because yeah. we create, you know, the parameters for this. Yeah. And yeah. we create the parameters for our life. Absolutely. Absolutely. So as you continue to create the new parameters for Jasmine and all these boundaries that you are tearing down, kicking down, um, what is important about that to you, of, of writing two more books, a children's book, of traveling, of doing more speaking? What's important to, to you, Jasmine, at the end of the day? Why is this important? Because it's, it's an incredible amount of time that you are dedicating to building this enterprise. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you asked me like, how, what does success look like for me? And it is the impact. And so I want to reach and teach 
and connect with as many people as I can. And so that's why it's important to me because that will maximize my impact. That's what I'm trying to do. Do you want to stop feeling like you have little to no control over your life's journey and instead amplify your life's purpose? You all know me as Angela Taylor, host of the Unlocking the Club podcast, but I am also a business, career, life, and leadership coach helping my clients to live their best life. Every day, I help my clients discover what they truly want in life and then unlock the club on how they can live their best life. If you're like many of my clients, you have found yourself over the years prioritizing everyone else and everything else, your job, your significant other, your family, your friends, your community, the list goes on and on. Well, I'm here to tell you the best thing you can do for others is to invest in yourself. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to succumb to the fear of failure. You don't have to be perfect. You don't need to feel like you're being selfish. You simply need to prioritize you. You may be thinking that coaching is for other people, but trust me when I say that we all could benefit from a good coaching relationship. Together, we'll build a plan to help you amplify your gifts, clarify your goals, and accelerate your journey toward the life you desire, which may be finding financial wealth, spiritual health, relationship success, and or freedom and flexibility. You no longer have to feel like you aren't welcome into someone else's club. Let me empower you to leverage all of your extraordinary gifts and create your own club. Head on over to unlockingtheclub.com to book a free 20-minute introductory call to learn more about our Unlocking Your Journey coaching packages or use code UNLOCK to get a 15% discount on the six-month coaching package. Today is the day to invest in yourself. Let's unlock your journey. We're back here on Unlocking the Club with our special guest, Jasmine Brett Stringer. And Jasmine, one of the questions I'm really curious about um, is your golf game. Like, so I've heard that you like to dibble and dabble out on the golf course. Uh, and I think that that is a really important club that more Black women are trying to unlock. Tell us a little bit about your journey through golf and what you've learned about um, the practice of golf and what it's brought to your life. Yeah, so I probably, I picked up golf about 16 years ago when I moved to Minnesota. I started playing with some Black women. We took lessons together. We were in an impromptu league together. Um, and then life happened. I, I joined a league at work. I got laid off. I played a little, but then I kind of stopped playing. And then I picked the game back up during the summer um, or last summer, and I really enjoyed it. So I should say the summer of 2021. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I missed golf. And I made a commitment this year that I was going to sign up for a league. I wanted to play more. I have a friend. I actually have two girlfriends, uh, Black girlfriends, that are into playing golf. And so one of them is a sub in the league. One of Another one we play every weekend together. And it's been a lot of fun. And I will tell you that, you know, a lot of people think we play at municipal courts, you know. So I'm playing a round of golf with a cart for, like, under – $35. And so to me, I describe golf as my yoga practice. So it is a practice of mindfulness. It's a practice of connection because I play, you know, whether I'm playing with my husband or a friend, you're getting like quality time together. We're being mindful. I have to be mindful. Like I can't worry about what's on email, what's on Instagram. I can't listen to a podcast. I can't multitask and play golf well. And it's a challenge and it's a self challenge because even though you're playing with other people, you're playing against yourself. And one of the things that I enjoy about the league is that I'm playing the same course. And so I get to see like, how am I doing? Um, and it's, it's, it actually is a lot of fun. It is. It really is. And I think that there's so many black women who hesitate to even consider playing golf, but it's brought the same thing to me. When I lived in Minneapolis, people were trying to get me out in the golf course because it's finally beautiful and, you know, in late May and you have this summer to be out on the, on the links. Um, but I was like, I, golf is not for me. And I wish I had taken it up way back when, um, because it really is. It's cathartic. You're out in a beautiful space um, playing this game that is physically and mentally challenging. 
Uh, and, and honestly, it's, it's unlocking the club. In every conversation that I'm on, if I'm playing in a mixed group of people that I don't know, I come away with people in my network, people right. that I can do business with or people that um, can, can actually leverage my businesses and, and want to partner on some, some different things. So I love that you're, you're in these leagues, and I love that there's a group of Black women in, in Minneapolis that are playing golf and unlocking that particular club. Yeah. You know, I will say I regret not playing golf in my earlier days. I started my career in sales. And I remember when I lived in Alabama, I had the opportunity to play the Robert Trent Jones golf trail like every single month with my client. And I never played. I didn't even really understand. I didn't even take the time to do the research on like, what is this golf course and how you know beautiful it is. And so I, I encourage everyone to get out there. You just never know. You might discover a new love. You just may. And I think that's a really important thing because for me, one of the reasons I didn't understand the game, like everybody I knew that played golf was always frustrated when they got done playing a round of golf. But I also didn't see anyone that looked like me right. playing golf. And so I wasn't quite sure if it was a space for me. But I think there's a lot of those spaces that we may not see representation and may not think it's a place for us, but it just may. If it's something that you're interested in, just try it out. Is there anything else, Jasmine, that you are currently like a little bit hesitant to do that maybe you should be willing to try out, to learn, to grow, and to, to add into your bucket of things to do? Let's see, what am I hesitant to do? Um... I'm not hesitant on too much. I don't like heights, so I will say that. <laughs> I don't know what I can do about heights. You know, I did hear this amazing speaker talk about skydiving and just the whole experience. And I don't know if I'm there yet to to try skydiving or even go in that building, I think it's called Sky, and, and do the, the skydiving experience. Um, but, you know, I am a a go-getter. So when I set my eye on something, I go after it. I love it. I love it. Well, one last question, and then we want to hear where we can we can find you. Uh, what do you do to center yourself? Yep. Yeah, so I you know, every morning I do um, a a spiritual reading um, before I get out of bed. I do my gratitude practice. And I mean, I do, I've talked a lot about phones. I actually do them all on my phone. I read this thing every morning. I write in this app and I actually add a picture to my gratitude journal every single day. I think gardening, something that I do in the summertime, it like connects me to nature. Even when I'm not at the farm, I, I love flowers. And I realize I think these flowers and these plants are connecting me to nature. So those are, are centering in grounding practices that I didn't know I was doing them to be grounded. But I find when I'm, when I'm feeling out of sorts, not out of balance, but out of sorts for me that, you know, touching the soil, touching a plant, even cutting, you know, the bottoms off of a flower uh, do something for me. I've always been a big candle lighter. I even travel with a candle. So something about lighting a candle and just seeing the flame, again, it's kind of like that grounding practice that I discussed earlier. Uh, it means something to me. I remember my mom always saying, what's up with you and these candles? Are you having a seance? But it's just a, a small act that carries a, a lot of weight and, and has an impact in my life. Mm. Oh, amazing things to do. And, and gardening is a place we'll have to have another conversation about that. Like I've, I'm new to gardening and it really is um, grounding for me in unique ways. I'm, I'm learning over the last couple of years in COVID of how much I value being outside. Yeah. Golfing, gardening, those sorts of things um, do ground me in ways that I hadn't discovered previously. Mm -hmm. I agree. Awesome. Awesome. Well, well, thanks, Jasmine. Jasmine, you're doing a lot of amazing things. You have a lot of projects going on now and coming up. Where can people find you? So people can find me online at Carpe Diem with Jasmine.com. That's um, Carpe Diem with Jasmine, J-A-S-M-I-N-E.com. You've had the social handles um, scrolling on the screen, Carpe Diem, JBS. The book, Seize Your Life, um, how to Carpe Diem Every Day is available on Amazon, available on my website. And hey, if you're looking for a engaging and inspiring speaker, please consider bringing me in for your next event. 
highly recommend. Um, you, your audience and participants um, will be energized. They'll learn a lot uh, and um, they'll learn how to seize the day. Um, because at the end of the day, that's what is incredibly important for each and every one of us. Angela, I got to seize the day and I got to come out to Boise and do the Boise food tour. You absolutely do. And for those of you, I have not shared this story before, but Jasmine was present when this idea about a food tour um, was planted in my head. And uh, I, years ago, probably about you know six years ago in a lunch conversation, we were talking about Boise, Idaho. And then another colleague of ours uh, mentioned that she had just taken a food tour, had never heard of it before, did some research, and then months later launched a food tour. So thank you for being there at the genesis of this idea for something. And you absolutely are welcome to come out to Boise uh, to take a hike, uh, to um, carpe diem, and to take an indulge Boise food tour. I love it. Thank you. I'm definitely going to take you up on that. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks again for joining us today on Unlocking the Club. Wow, another fantastic episode of Unlocking the Club. I'm your host, Angela Taylor. Thank you all for joining us for another conversation. Learned so much from Jasmine Brett Stringer about seizing the day. And it really is about that. Life is about those moments um, that sometimes we step over and we don't notice or we don't take the time to enjoy or the time to actually appreciate what's important to us. And um, today's conversation with Jasmine was a great reminder about some of the little things that you can do on a regular basis to live your authentic best self and best life. And so I hope you all enjoyed this conversation. If you wanna continue the discussion, we're gonna unpack a lot of the things that Jasmine shared with us on our Facebook page, the Code Breakers Lounge. So go ahead and, and find the Code Breakers Lounge on Facebook, Joining us, join us in this conversation and make sure that you follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Unlocking the Club to find out about more of our amazing guests that are coming up on the show. I'm Angela Taylor, your host for Unlocking the Club. And until next time, be well. Thanks for listening to Unlocking the Club. If this conversation resonated with you, subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or your favorite streaming platform so that you can experience every episode. And follow us on social media where you'll hear about future guests, access special features, and connect with this amazing community. Head on over there and let us know how you are unlocking the club. Until next time, peace.